And so I'll be kind of going through um, my research and some of the things we know about heat related illness in athletes, but certainly we can apply this to people working in the fields, people delivering the mail, uh, a great variety of settings. Some of the largest morbidity and mortality nationwide every year is in the agricultural and, and construction industry as far as heat related illness. So it's certainly important in those fields as it is in, in my arena of dealing with athletes. And so, if I can get the slides to advance. Yeah, and so, uh, just to kind of tell you what I'm gonna tell you, some of the things we know, Sandra Fouts Godak is a athletic trainer, PhD up in Philadelphia, Westchester University, I believe, and she's done a lot of work with professional athletes and has shown us that athletes exercising the heat lose a tremendous amount of fluids, and lose a tremendous amount of electrolytes in certain settings, and that has to be compensated for. And certainly, this applies to workers in the field, workers in construction, those kinds of things. It seems that some people are more predisposed to muscle cramping than some of the more mild heat-related illness, probably related to their overall sweat rate, but also their sweat sodium concentration. And so people that tend to cramp a lot, limiting their productivity, tend to lose more salt uh, than non-crampers. And this is some of the, from some of the work done by uh, Dr. Eichner out at University of Oklahoma. And then things that we do to sort of mitigate that effect um, can have results. And so when we modify practice schedules, uniforms, hydration protocols, athlete monitoring, emergency response systems, uh, those have an effect on uh, athlete performance. Uh, athlete safety, and certainly this can be applied obviously to things we do in the in whatever field we're operating in. And yeah, there we go. And so one of the problems is hypohydration. Uh, as people work in the fields or people perform on the field, uh, they lose fluids, they lose electrolytes. And so hypohydration really is just when our sweat output exceeds our water intake. Obviously, our sweat evaporation is one of our primary modes for heat dissipation, and that's effective, and that's helpful, and that improves as we acclimatize to an environment. But as we get an increased net loss of body fluid, um, that starts to become more and more prevalent, not only from the extracellular compartment uh, where it starts, but also even the intracellular compartment, and that can lead to problems. It can lead to compromised thermal regulation, even in those people who are used to working in the heat. And as we get greater and greater degrees of dehydration, we get increased losses from that intracellular compartment, which can lead to more uh, metabolic challenges. We see this in my world with exercise and heat, but you can also see it with febrile illness. You can see it with gastrointestinal disorders. And ultimately, this can happen primarily from evaporation, but also from illness, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, normal urinary losses, normal sputum losses, and then just kind of through the body and sensible losses, uh, somewhat through evaporation in the pulmonary tree. And as we exercise, we obviously generate metabolic heat. And this is true of a worker in the field. This is true of an athlete uh, working out and performing. As we get an increase in body core temperature from convective conduction, um, through our metabolic activity, we try to compensate for that loss uh, by heat dissipation, largely through sweat. Once our set point, and this is very individual, is exceeded, uh, thermal regulatory mechanisms have to activate. And so we try to balance this heat dissipation with endogenous heat production and things like temperature, humidity, sun exposure, wind and clothing can either benefit or compromise uh, that balance, that ability to dissipate the heat. Our anterior hypothalamus controls our heat dissipation. Warm receptors trigger cutaneous vasodilation to try to help get rid of some of that heat. Uh, hypothalamic osmoreceptors sense an increase in osmolality as our blood gets a little bit more concentrated as we lose fluids. And this can lead to a great deal of, of issue depending on the setting. We know from some of the work done by Eichner with college football athletes, we can lose as much as three and a half to four liters of fluid during a typical two and a half hour, two a day football practice. Sandra Phelps Godak uh, up with the Eagles has shown that at the professional level, they can lose somewhere 
uh, around 2.14 liters per hour on average, which ends up producing about 4.8 liters in an AM practice, 4.8 liters in a PM practice. And so you can have losses as high as 9.4 liters of daily sweat loss with two a day practices in the heat at the professional level. And to replace that, we have to replace about 120% of that. Um, and that's 12.2 liters of fluid in a day. So obviously that's a tremendous amount of fluid loss to replace. And so obviously a worker in a field or anyone working through the day in the heat, uh, evaporating uh, sweat to compensate for the heat uh, can have tremendous body fluid losses that are hard to keep up with. As we get more and more dehydrated, that prompts some uh, changes in our body. We get vasodilation, we get shunting of our blood to the periphery, we get sweat gland activation. And as we increase work intensity, our sweat rate increases. Uh, our sweat rate increases with environmental heat. Uh, typically, sweat rates are anywhere from one to three liters per hour and variable by the person, variable by the degree of acclimatization. And that's an effective uh, way to eliminate heat. We can eliminate 2.7 kilojoules of heat per ml of sweat, uh, but obviously there's a cost to that in hydration if we're not keeping up uh, with our losses. And as you increase humidity, as you increase dehydration, as you increase ambient temperature, uh, we get less and less efficient at getting rid of that heat. As we get more and more dehydrated or hypohydrated, uh, osmolality of blood increases. The hypothalamus triggers vasopressin release via the pituitary and renin release via the kidneys, so we get increased water and sodium retention in the kidneys. We get an increased thirst drive, which kicks in somewhere around three to 5% dehydration. And fluid absorption, even in the optimal lab environment, is about 0.8 to one liter per hour. We know from studies in endurance athletes, we're not able to take in that optimal amount. Uh, runners typically take in 300 to 500 mLs per hour, so clearly they have a net fluid loss when they're exercising in the heat. And even cyclists who tend to be the optimal hydrators, they're on a bike, they can have fluids on their bike, even they only probably take in about 600 to 800 mLs per hour. So really with athletes exercising in the heat, even in a very controlled environment, they are getting uh, progressively hypohydrated over time. It's just a question of how much. Most of what we lose is, is water, uh, but and sweat is hypotonic, but it, we do lose electrolytes. And so uh, so sweat contains sodium, contains potassium, contains chloride, contains magnesium. And as we increase our sweat rate, we lose more and more electrolytes. We also burn carbohydrates with muscle activity, uh, which can lead to hypoglycemia and fatigue. And so the average sweat sodium loss for collegiate athletes exercising in the heat for two and a half hour football practice is about five grams which is pretty substantial when you think of the, a, a normal dietary intake of somewhere around 10 to 13 grams in a, in a day. Mike Bergeron, uh, looking at elite tennis athletes exercising in the heat, has shown uh, in some athletes, particularly an athlete with a really high sweat rate, a really high sweat sodium concentration, a very high total sweat loss in the day, can lose as much as 48 grams of sodium chloride in a day, um, which is a tremendous amount of salt loss. And so this varies by the athlete, but we can't forget about the electrolyte losses um, in very high sweat rate, very high sweat sodium concentration over a long day working in the heat. And this is certainly gonna be true of some uh, workers uh, out in the field. In team sports, it's particularly difficult, much more so than endurance athletes, because the work rate is often difficult to predict. You have multiple intense work bouts at near maximal effort, but then intervals of rest and low intensity exercise. And this may mimic more a worker who's gonna have periods of working at very high levels, and then periods where they're in between jobs, in between uh, tasks, where they might have lower levels of activity. There's a high degree of individual variability by position, by size of the athlete, by style of play, 
There's a great deal of sport variability in protective gear, in uniforms, in season, indoor, outdoor athletes. I never thought heat would be a big problem for ice hockey, where you have athletes exercising on a huge sheet of frozen water, uh, but hockey goalies lose a tremendous amount of sweat uh, wearing about 80 pounds of gear. Uh, and so obviously our protective environment, our protective uniform uh, can significantly influence the impact of, of heat on our bodies. There's a significant loss of body water when participating, and obviously with team sports, as with working in the field, uh, psychomotor demands uh, play a significant role, and progressive dehydration and early heat-related illness can certainly affect that performance. So what does that mean? Uh, certainly for athletes and workers, as they get more and more hypohydrated, as they're uh, internal core temperature elevates, we get decreased blood volume, we get impaired heat dissipation, we get reduced oxygen carrying capacity to the muscles, we get decreased uh, heart stroke volume, decreased cutaneous blood flow, impaired gastric emptying, so it gets harder and harder to replace that fluid, and then we get decreased splanchnic and renal blood flow, uh, and obviously decreased performance. This is obviously relevant to not only athletes, uh, performing on the field, but then workers uh, working out in the environment as well. We get increased heart rate, increased core temperature, increased perceived effort. Athletes and workers feel like they're working harder as they get more dehydrated and core temperature rises. We get increased catecholamines or stress hormones. We get increased core temperature at a given intensity of work rate. We get enhanced muscle glycogen breakdown. And then in the very severe extreme cases, we get hyperthermia and death from exertional heat stroke. We know that it's not just the heat of that day. So we know from particularly our military colleagues looking at soldiers working in the field um, that the wet bulb globe temperature of the preceding days actually increases uh, our, our soldiers' risk for heat stroke. So there's a, a concern about cumulative heat exposure and how that might affect us on the field of play or in the work environment. And obviously there are performance consequences. So Armstrong has looked at athletes uh, with running velocity and a 2% dehydration led to increased times and decreased running velocity in longer distance events. Greater than 2% fluid deficits were associated with significantly decreased performance on psychomotor tests. And this was progressive with increased dehydration. And cyclists exercising in the heat have an increased heart rate, have increased perceived exertion, increased core body temperature, as well as decreased stroke volume, decreased cardiac output that was directly proportional to the degree of dehydration. So dehydration or hypohydration is affecting our athletes' performance and certainly can be affecting our workers' performance in the field. A 1.8% body mass fluid deficit significantly impaired performance in high intensity exercise, uh, and 2% fluid deficits had a trend towards decrease in free throw accuracy uh, and thir uh, 30 second jump testing. And so again, dehydration, hypohydration, increased core temperature can affect our performance at um, fine motor tasks and certainly out in the field. What we see in athletes and what we see in workers are clinical syndromes. And so a uh, heat illness can present with very mild things like heat cramps, heat syncope, or just passing out in the heat. Uh, heat exhaustion, you know, that fatigue level when working in the heat where you just feel like you can't go on anymore. And then the most significant being exertional heat stroke, which we'll talk about a little bit. And also hyponatremia. So if you're exercising out in the field for a long period of time, and you're replacing that sweat with just free water, um, you're eventually gonna deplete your serum sodium, become hyponatremic, and in the most severe cases, can collapse and have seizures. And so we wanna be careful about what we're replacing those losses with. If we're exerting ourselves over long periods of time, we wanna replace with not only water, but an electrolyte beverage, uh, say a carbohydrate electrolyte beverage that has some salt, has some potassium, has some magnesium, 
This is what it looks like when our offensive linemen are exercising in the heat. And so you can see this linear core temperature rise as athletes start practice and start to increase their core temperature. This red line is significant because it's right around 103 degrees. Now these are totally asymptomatic athletes exercising in the heat. Remember 104.9 is that sort of arbitrary cutoff for um, heat stroke. These athletes are asymptomatic, but they're getting up over 103 at peak exertion, and then they take a break and their core temperature comes down, and then they start exerting themselves again, and they get this linear rise again with core temperature going up over 103 degrees. So this is happening out in the field uh, daily without us knowing, and we have to be really cautious uh, to watch these athletes and workers exerting themselves at high levels in the heat. Um, for incompensable heat stress, where they, their bodies are just no longer properly dissipating heat. We know from two-a-day football practices that in our athletes exercising in the morning, their, their slope of core temperature rise is a bit sharper in the morning, where they're typically wearing full pads and exerting at very high levels. And in the afternoon, they're starting with a higher core temperature, probably from built-up heat stress, but the afternoon practice was often a little bit less intense with less full gear. And so their slope of core temperature rise was a little bit less steep, uh, probably due to the exertion and less uh, pads, less protective gear, allowing them to dissipate heat a little bit better. We know that, that when we look at our different athletes, uh, linemen and non-linemen have a little bit different uh, work rate. Uh, they have a little bit different uh, hydration status, but overall, they had a fairly similar work output. So our non-linemen, our, our receivers, our defensive backs, they're covering more ground, uh, but they're not doing quite the static load that our linemen are doing. So overall, when you look at GPS data, when you look at work rate, their work rates were fairly similar. When we put athletes in the heat lab and have them exercise, these blue dots are their heart rate. This red line is their core temperature. And again, you see athletes exercising that are fairly asymptomatic. They feel like they're doing well, but their core temperature spiking up over 103. And so again, this is happening in the field. This was under conditions that are supposed to reflect kind of normal uh, Florida environment with high heat and high humidity uh, exercising. And again, their core temperature getting up over that 103 threshold, even with asymptomatic status. This is a soccer athlete. So it's not just with football athletes. This is a soccer athlete. And again, the blue dots are heart rate with frequent monitoring, basically continuous monitoring. And the red line is core temperature. And again, the soccer athlete who's wearing a lot less gear is getting up over 101 core temperature uh, with exertion in the heat. And this was surprising to me because, uh, again, when you look at the athletes that were exercising in the heat, there, there were athletes that I would expect to get into trouble and athletes I wouldn't. This was actually a soccer goalie. And so what I didn't realize is in, in practice, a soccer goalie is taking repetitive shots high intensity activity during certain times of practice. And that soccer goalie not only broke my device from diving for balls, but also got a, a significant elevation in core temperature over time from high intensity exercise that I thought soccer goalies just stood around during practice, but apparently uh, they're pretty active. When we look at our uh, positions, it varies uh, on their overall core temperature. And so offensive linemen uh, get hotter than offensive backs, like running backs and quarterbacks, both AM practice and PM practice. Offensive linemen get hotter than defensive linemen in AM practice and PM practice. Defensive linemen get hotter than defensive backs and wide receivers, um, and offensive backs get hotter than defensive backs and wide receivers. And these were statistically significant through multiple practices. And so there are athletes in a football team that we particularly have to be concerned about, primarily offensive linemen and defensive linemen. And when you look at a lot of the more recent high profile heat stroke deaths of football athletes, it's typically 
early summer conditioning. It's typically our offensive linemen, defensive linemen that are at highest risk of those really dangerous elevations in core temperature. We also know again that when we measure symptoms and we, we developed an inventory called um, the heat stress index uh, or, or heat illness symptom index where we'll get out to our players to assess their overall symptomatology after practice. We can't always monitor all athletes core temperature just because it costs, but we can certainly monitor symptoms. And when we monitor symptoms, their heat stress index from that day certainly predicts how hot they're going to be. And their heat stress symptom index from the day prior uh, also seems to uh, predict core temperature elevation. So be careful to monitor your workers, your employees exercising in the heat for symptomatology uh, because as their symptoms get higher, their risk of core temperature elevations to the dangerous level are going to get higher. We also know that self-generated air velocity affects cooling. And so those wide receivers and defensive backs are lighter, they're covering more ground, and it seems that as they run and generate their own uh, wind velocity from running, they dissipate heat better. And certainly linemen are not as able to do that as they're not covering as much ground, they're not generating as much self-generated air velocity to help them dissipate the heat. And again, this may have significant implications in workers in the field. If they don't have access to self-generated air velocity, they're not going to have uh, as much ability to dissipate that heat. And particularly if wind levels are low, uh, that, may imp that may impact their ability to dissipate heat. And so what do we do about it? How do we try to mitigate these effects? Well, we've looked at a few things trying to limit the core temperature elevations in our athletes, and some are successful and some not so. We took 21 defensive uh, Division I football offensive linemen. We monitored their core temperature via, via ingestible thermistors, and we gave them a traditional break where they just rested in the shade and drank fluids versus putting them in a cold chamber. It was somewhere around 40 to 50 degrees and uh, initially 0% humidity to try to cool them in the middle of practice to see what effect that would have on their overall uh, core temperature. And then we measured their um, symptoms by heat illness symptom questionnaire to look for subjective symptoms. Uh, we had lots of willing participants. When you tell football offensive linemen that they get to take a break in the middle of practice and sit down in a cold chamber, uh, they were very willing to participate. The outdoor conditions, wet bulb globe temperature uh, was typically at 94. Uh, the heat index was around 103, and humidity was average around 65%. Inside the polar pod, wet bulb globe temperature was around 52, and humidity, once you get a bunch of sweaty football linemen in there, rose up to 50%, but was still better than ambient conditions. But when we looked at their cooling rate, we looked at their max temperatures, it did not significantly impact their temperature. Maybe we needed to leave them in there longer. Uh, we didn't have a very long break during football practice because coaches want to get work done. Uh, but overall, it did not significantly impact their cooling rate. Subjectively, though, overall, they felt a little bit better. Um, some subjective sort of qualitative feedback was athletes felt refreshed. They felt improved energy. Uh, this has not been scientifically confirmed. One athlete said he died in the polar pod, brought him back to life. I'm pretty sure that was not a fact, uh, true. Uh, somebody asked a question, what is wet bulb globe temperature? Wet bulb globe temperature is a way to measure the overall heat stress of an environment. It's pretty much the standard used in scientific studies. Uh, it's it's been shown to be somewhat reflected in the more commonly used heat index, which is what we mostly use uh, when we're talking about environmental conditions to the public. But wet bulb globe temperature takes into effect the radiant heat from the environment, the effect of humidity, the effect of wind, and the overall uh, uh, heat stress impact from the environment. And so ideally in scientific studies, we'd be talking about wet bulb globe temperature. And you can measure that with a pretty easy device on the field through a work day. 
Um, but you can also talk about heat index, which is easier to obtain from weather data. So thanks for that question. Uh, heat sports medicine, soccer, heat physiology study. So after we did this study with football athletes, uh, we wanted to see if in, an, in a soccer athlete who's wearing less gear, uh, does she have an easier time compensating for the heat? So with our women's soccer team, we did a similar study to what we did with the offensive linemen. We took 12 Division I female soccer athletes. Um, they were randomized to either a regular shade, uh, taking in fluids break during the middle of soccer practice, or placed in the Polar Pod cold trailer. Um, their environmental conditions were recorded. Their core temperature was monitored via these ingestible thermistors and then heart rates were monitored using wearable sensors. Um, percent loss of body weight and urine specific gravity were measured, and then repeated measures were assessed over time. And the question uh, was just raised about do men and women uh, respond to the heat the same way? And the answer is really no. Again, the, the research continues to go on about the total implications to that, but you know, generally within men and women, individuals respond differently to the heat based on what your sweat rate is. So women tend to sweat less than men. An average male sweat rate working in the heat is about a liter and a half per hour. Women tend to sweat about a liter per hour on average. Um, and their acclimatization status can affect it. So no, men and women don't respond to the heat exactly the same. Mean wet bulb globe temperature was similar across days, and the percent of time in various aerobic exercise zones was pretty similar. Um, and ultimately, we showed fairly similar results. Uh, our female athletes overall, that polar pod cooling chamber did not significantly impact their max temperature or their cooling rate. Uh, but subjectively, the athletes uh, liked being in that cold chamber, as you would expect. Uh, also looking at hydration, and so various studies have looked at the impact of hydration on, um, on core temperature, and one of our studies we did with 21 Division, uh, division I football players, overall some of the biggest predictors of core temperature were really just their intensity, uh, how hard they were working out, and in that particular study, their hydration practices did not particularly predict uh, their max temperature or their average temperature. A question was asked about how these core temperature uh, thermistors work, and it's basically technology that was developed by Johns Hopkins for uh, NASA, and it's a pill about the size of a large multivitamin. You take it about three to four hours before practice, and it passes into your small intestine, and then with an external device, you can um, measure core temperature. You just walk up to them with a device that is about the size of a large calculator, you put in a number that you've assigned to that athlete, and then you can measure their core temperature at any point during practice. If you have a lot of these devices, you can actually strap the device to them and measure continuously. Or when we're measuring 75 athletes during the practice, we just walk around with one of these devices, we punch in their jersey number that we've assigned to correspond to the pill that they took, and you can measure their core temperature as they go through drills. So it's just a way to wire and wirelessly measure a core temperature. So thanks for that question. We also looked at sweat rate, and so offensive linemen have a harder time dissipating heat. We know that. One of the reasons for that may be their local sweat rate. So they tend to sweat um, more on their upper body. Sometimes that sweat is so concentrated that they can't really evaporate it well and so they're, they're challenged in their heat dissipation. We know that most of us get most of our heat dissipation when working out in the heat by sweating. And if you get so densely saturated with sweat on your upper body, it can actually, actually compromise how well you dissipate that heat. And that's one of the issues challenging our large offensive linemen with properly dissipating heat. And so with our workers in the field, or our athletes, we can monitor athletes for problems. Uh, we can certainly monitor it for predisposing illness. 
In one study in people uh, that were hit with heat stroke, one of the biggest predictors was a respiratory or GI illness the week prior to their episode of heat stroke. So anytime we get sick, our risk of heat stroke is higher, even as we're recovering from that illness. Certainly monitoring environmental conditions, you can use heat index, or ideally you can use wet bulb globe temperature to measure the impact of the environmental conditions on the athlete or worker. Uh, people monitoring um, our athletes or our workers for struggling are critical. In my environment, it's our athletic trainers that are on the sidelines watching athletes for problems. In the work environment, it might be a supervisor. Uh, be conscious of excessive work at any given position. And so whether it's in the field or on the athletic field, be very careful about excessive repetitions of any uh, work rate. When our freshman uh, football players first show up during summer conditioning, if there's a small amount of athletes exercising at a very high level, that's going to be a high-risk environment. We need to watch those athletes even more closely. Be watchful for mild or more severe uh, heat illness. Be careful for core temperature, heart rate monitoring, which again, we can do in certain settings. Uh, watch for heat illness symptom index or some way that you watch your athletes. Uh, weight changes post-practice. Be careful about weight changes. You can weigh your workers or your um, athletes before they practice, weigh them after practice, and that give them, gives them a pretty good gauge of their fluid losses. So train your athletes or your workers to properly replace their hydration over time. And again, replacing fluid electrolyte losses, either oral or in severe cases, IV, is critical, especially oral hydration. Most studies say in most environments, we can keep up with our losses enough to prevent illness by oral hydration, but we have to be really consistent with doing that. And then obviously immediate cooling for even mild heat-related illness. Certainly the treatment for exertional heat stroke is immediate cooling in an ice bath, um, whether ideally you could do that in a, um, a tub filled mostly with ice and a little bit of water. Um, and immediately cool them. That's almost like an AED for heat stroke. Just like with cardiac illness, of application of an immediate AED is critical for saving lives. If you have an athlete or a worker that you think is suffering from heat stroke, getting them in a uh, cool, cold water ice bath or uh, getting them in a tarp, pouring ice on them and wrapping them up and, and circulating that ice water uh, is critical while you activate your emergency action plan uh, by calling 911 or whatever your emergency action plan is. Uh, somebody asked about medications that predispose to heat-related illness. So the classic ones would be antihistamines, uh, stimulants. Uh, some of the psychotropic medicines uh, like antidepressants decrease our sweat rate. Uh, so those would be critical. Some uh, high blood pressure medicines. The biggest one would be a diuretic that increases fluid loss that can influence our risk of heat-related illness. So classically, uh, stimulants, antihistamines, blood pressure medicines, uh, antidepressants would be big ones. But so make sure your workers or your athletes are being seen by their primary care physician getting a good pre-participation exam to make sure that they're aware of any risks that might um, be concerning for them. Emergency treatment needs to be on a high priority. Obviously, most of us are not going to face a heat stroke episode, but if you are uh, in a position where you have workers exerting themselves in the heat, you have to have the ability to emergently cool them. And so if any worker or athlete is working out in the heat and starts to develop mental confusion, that's kind of heat stroke until proven otherwise. So your emergency action plan needs to kick in your airway, your breathing, your circulation from your uh, basic uh, life support needs to be applied. And added to that would be uh, a, a core temperature assessment. Many studies have shown that ear temperature under the tongue temperature, axillary temperature is not accurate. So you really need in the, in the life-threatening setting of an acute heat stroke, paramedics or your advanced um, uh, Medical personnel on scene really ideally need to get a core temperature by a rectal temperature. 
And that's going to be the only true core temperature um, unless you have these heat thermistors in place, which of course, most of the time we're not going to have. So if you have an athlete or a worker that you think is suffering heat stroke, you know, dial 911, activate, activate your emergency action plan, try to cool them immediately with ice water immersion or what's called a taco, where you um, lay them on a tarp, get ice on them, and circulate that ice uh, while they cool. It's critical to get their core temperature down because they're literally cooking and their proteins in their body are breaking down by the minute. Um, heat stroke is almost universally survivable, but it's critical to get that immediate cooling while you activate your emergency action plan. The goal is to get their core temperature down to 101. If you get them lower than that, sometimes they'll start shivering and their core temperature will shoot up again. But core temperature drop by immediate ice water immersion or a, a cold tarp with ice bath uh, would be a great way to get their temperature down. Watch for cardiac arrhythmia. Watch for seizures. These people will enter multi-organ failure, heart failure, liver failure, and something called disseminated intravascular coagulation, where they actually start to use up all their clotting factors in their blood, and then they start to bleed everywhere. So this uh, heat stroke is an absolute medical emergency, and if you think you're facing that, immediate cooling and activation of your emergency action plan is critical to save lives. Somebody asked what, at, what happens during heat acclimatization. And in general, it takes seven to 10 days uh, of exercise in the heat to fully acclimatize, to get used to the heat stress. So you wanna have your workers very gradually increase their workload so that they can um, uh, get used to exercising in the heat. And as you're fully acclimatized, you are better at sweating and dissipating that heat. You're better at holding on to fluids and electrolytes. Your core temperature doesn't rise as much when you're exerting yourself in the heat. So you deal with the heat better and you're better able to keep your core temperature down and you're much lower risk of developing exertional heat stroke. And then somebody asked what IBF stands for. That's intravenous fluids. If you have medical personnel on site, in addition to cooling them immediately, uh, we would want to get IV access to give them IV fluids and also have a way to give them electrolytes or things, medications that they might need by an IV. Most people obviously working out in the field are not going to have the ability to do IV fluids, but you do have the ability to get immediate ice bath on that person. And so if you have a worker that's down in the field and you suspect heat stroke, uh, get ice on them in any way you can to try to lower their core temperature while they're being transported, while you're calling 911, that immediate cooling is absolutely uh, critical. And so get your athletes or your workers conditioned and acclimatized. Make sure they're hydrated well. You want them to enter the work day or the practice session uh, well hydrated, so have them drink fluids right before the work day, at least 20 ounces, two to three cups, assuming they're already uh, back to hydration, normal hydration status from the prior work day. You want them to drink about 10 ounces every 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, ideally, they would get about a liter of fluid replacement per hour, which will um, not fully, but almost replace their fluid losses. Uh, if they're not sure about how much fluid they lose in a day, have them weigh uh, before their day of work, have them weigh after their day of work, and that difference is their fluid deficit. And ideally, you want them to drink about 24 ounces or three cups per pound of body weight loss to replace their losses from the preceding day. You want your workers or your athletes to feel free to let you know if they're struggling. Most of the heat stroke deaths happen when people knew that they were struggling and continued to press through with heroic effort. And once they develop early heat stroke, they get confused. And so they don't, they can't fully protect themselves. Many stories have circulated about these athletes or workers or soldiers developing heat stroke. They get confused. They just wander off the job site. If nobody's watching them, they could end up collapsed in a corner with no one knowing they were having trouble. 
So we really need our athletes or our workers to be able to tell us if they're struggling early so we can get them cooled down before it becomes an emergency. And again, if you have an athlete or a worker you think is suffering from heat stroke, immediate cooling and activation of your emergency action plan is critical. And that cooling ideally would be with an ice bath. You can use things like symptom questionnaires to uh, find out what athletes or workers are struggling in the heat. A uh, question was asked, what are, are there symptom questionnaires out there that are suitable for agricultural employees? And there are numerous questions out there. You would have to see which ones were appropriate for your workers. Our questionnaire, the Heat Illness Symptom Index, was really geared towards athletes exercising in their heat. Uh, the big thing is, is any of these sort of environmental questionnaires that are out there, see which ones might work for your uh, agricultural employees. I would have to do a literature search to see, see if any of these questionnaires have been used effectively during agricultural work, uh, but I imagine some are out there that could be used. The biggest thing, again, is, is a, 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 a practice of monitoring your workers for the environmental conditions they're exposed to, uh, their workload, and having them feel comfortable coming to you if they're starting to struggle uh, so that you can get them cooled. And so I think we hit most of the questions as we were going through. Did anybody have other um, questions? Let's see. Um, Nicole asked, will drinking fluids, plenty of fluids during the day before increased hydration on the day of exercise or field work is taking an electrolyte tablet similar to drinking a sports drink. So I'll, I'll answer sort of several questions within there. Certainly drinking plenty of fluids the day before will get you to you hydration, but it won't necessarily absolutely protect you the following day. You wanna make sure you're drinking plenty of fluids the day before, uh, but you also won't have to make sure you're drinking plenty of fluids the day of question as well. Is taking an electrolyte tablet the same? It's absolutely not. So the electrolyte tablet only replaces your electrolytes. It's not going to replace uh, your fluids. And so taking an electrolyte tablet and taking fluids is probably reasonable. Uh, but I would say during the event, if you're gonna be out there exerting yourself in the heat for long periods of time, replacing with a sports drink is probably a good way to go. If it's a short exercise bout, water is fine. If it's a longer exercise bout, probably taking that carbohydrate and electrolyte beverage is gonna help you um, maintain those electrolytes. Hypohydration is just another word for dehydration, so I'm not sure there's any great uh, difference there. And does this uh, have any applicability to predicting the possible occurrence of rhabdo? Acute exertional rhabdomyolysis is a different problem. Uh, we see this most commonly in our sickle cell trait athletes. Um, and hydration does significantly impact that. If you stay hydrated, you're going to decrease your risk of acute exertional rhabdomyolysis. Um, it's not a guarantee that you won't get it, uh, but certainly um, ex acute exertional rhabdomyolysis is of growing concern in our athletes, particularly our sickle cell trait positive athletes. And hydration and conditioning have a great role in that and monitoring your athletes, because these athletes that have acute exertional rhabdomyolysis typically have heroic efforts over short burst exercise with no recovery. And if they can tell their athletic trainer, their uh, strength and conditioning coach that they're starting to struggle, they will save their, their own life. And so certainly symptom monitoring becomes really important in acute exertional rhabdomyolysis, but that's a different problem than exertional heat illness. And so I think we hit most of the questions. Were there any questions that we did not uh, cover? And Philip, I don't know if you need to chime in as far as moderating. I, I think we've covered most of the questions that popped up from the, the chat board. Yes, yeah, thank you, Dr. Corris. Um, yeah, if there are any other questions that are coming in over the next 10 minutes or so, feel free to type those in. I think there was one question. Um, I apologize if you did address this. Someone asked about uh, what to do when 
uniforms and clothing becomes uh, saturated with water. You said that could be a, um, uh, you know, maybe I'll just read the question, but uh, what is the most optimal approach to cooling, wiping sweat off or leaving it there? Uh, so the optimal approach to cooling is going to be wiping it off if, it, if the skin is super saturated. You know, generally your body is excellent at dissipating heat and the primary method for dissipating that heat is sweat. And so as that, as that sweat super saturates or if the uniform gets super saturated, that's going to be a barrier to heat dissipation. So we'll coach up our athletes and not all of them listen. You can see in this picture, uh, this athlete has a cotton shirt underneath their jersey. That's a big barrier to heat dissipation. And so we actually made that a rule shortly after this that they cannot wear cotton shirts underneath their jersey. Things that you do with your uniform, things that your workers do with their uniform can significantly impact their ability to dissipate heat. Some workers have to work in a, in a chemical protective suit. That's a tremendous barrier to heat dissipation. And so that, that athlete or that worker is gonna be able to work for shorter periods and they're gonna need greater recovery periods with removal of that protective gear. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that was all the questions that I had seen come in. So at this time, unless there are any other questions that come in over the next couple minutes, um, let me just briefly uh, put up the schedule for the webinars that we have throughout the remain, uh, remaining year. Uh, the next one, we have Dr. Lisa Lundy from here at the University of Florida. Uh, she'll be talking about delivering agricultural health and safety research to stakeholders, best practices and theoretical foundations. So kind of a different approach than um, some of the other webinars we've had, but uh, Dr. Lisa Lundy is uh, part of the center and um, we invite all of you to join us on August 29th for that at 10 a.m. And um, one last thing, um, once you exit today's webinar, a survey should pop up. It should take no more than about five minutes, if that, um, to complete. And that just helps us monitor how we're doing with our webinars and get some ideas for future ones as well. Uh, there was a question for me. Uh, will you be sending out a link to the webinar recording? Yes, if you registered for today's webinar, you will receive that um, in an email. Um, also, it'll be on the website as well, sccahs.org. But if you registered, you'll receive that. Um, very briefly, I want to thank Dr. Eric Kors. You know, fascinating discussion and fascinating talk. Uh, great to hear all the research, um, very practical research. There have been a few more questions that have come in, so I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Dr. Kors so he can address those. Sure, and so somebody asked, since all of the sports drinks have different amounts of sodium, potassium, and sugars, is there an estimated recommendation for target milligrams or electrolyte intake? Uh, there have been, and, and largely the sports drinks um, that are out there, um, particularly some of the biggest commercial products have fairly similar sodium, potassium, carbohydrate varies a little bit. Um, and so there's, there's sort of um, benefits and risks to that. As you increase the carbohydrate intake, you will potentially help yourself with exertional fatigue. Ideally, the goal is to take in about 60 grams of carbohydrate in an hour to help try to protect yourself from the fatigue. If you take in too much, you will decrease your gastric emptying. So as your carbohydrate intake increases, your gastric emptying decreases. And so it's kind of a, you have to find that sweet spot of enough carbohydrate to help you um, uh, prevent fatigue, but not too much. So in general, the commercially available sports electrolyte beverages out there are fairly comparable with some having more carbohydrate than another. And I would say have the worker or the athlete find what works best for them. The electrolyte content is fairly similar. Um, and the, the closest you could approach to replacing sweat losses, that would be kind of ideal. Uh, let's see, there's, uh, if sports drinks are not available, can milk or coconut water provide proper electrolyte uh, replenishment? So there's nothing magical about sports drinks. You can get your electrolytes from a great deal of other areas. Coconut water, I would have to look at the 
content, I don't think that's going to have enough of the electrolytes to substitute for a sports drink. Uh, actually, chocolate milk is a great recovery beverage from exercise in the heat. Uh, I'm not sure people can really keep milk good in a day of working in the heat, but, but milk is not a bad recovery beverage. Uh, because it has protein, because it has sodium, because it has electrolytes, and it has some carbohydrates. So that's actually an excellent recovery beverage. Um, and then I think there was another question up here. Uh, oh, not a question. Yeah. Yeah, and so when you talk about Gatorade, Gatorade is a good uh, electrolyte beverage, uh, as are some of the other sort of commercially available ones. And that was really constituted to try to be a good tasting version of liquid sweat. And so, uh, you know, the proper amount of sodium, potassium, electrolyte have been measured into most of those commercially available electrolyte beverages. Gatorade would be one of them. 